Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Reds Rundown Podcast, hosted by two lifelong Reds fans and journalists. I'm Rob. He's Joe. I mean, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Joe, how's it going? Did you have a good weekend? Where are you at with this freaking Reds team? All that jazz. You know, uh, it's it was a good weekend. I am the same spot with the Reds team as always. I'm getting excited for football season. Uh, college football is just... Uh, 12 days away as we're recording right now, which is good for me for college football week zero. Uh, but this Reds team, yeah, I gave up on them at the end of June, I want to say. Uh, it was, you know, what kind of when this started. Uh, I'm glad I did because my expectations are low. Now I can just watch and enjoy and see if anyone develops like we talked about last week, Rob. If there's anyone holding out hope, I know I've been very negative on this on this podcast. If there's anyone holding out hope, there is the possibility the Reds can still make a run. It's not very likely, but uh, 1973, the New York Mets were 12 games under 500 on August 26th, and they ended up making the playoffs uh, with a record of 83 and 79. What's impressive about that one uh, was they that was back when only four teams made the playoffs. There was National League East, National League West. They ended up making the playoffs with a record of 83 and 79. Unfortunately for our Reds, uh, the Mets beat us in the NLCS. That mm-hmm. you know they won the pennant over us, and uh, that was a big big deal because uh, the Reds and Mets had a little bit of hatred between themselves with Buddy Harrelson, the Mets second baseman shortstop, who. Uh, I had no fight with Pete Rose one time. So, uh, you know, not, not the greatest, but if you want an example of teams being able to come back and you want to have keep that hope and you're different than maybe I am with this team and want to say, hey, still got a chance until until it's over. There's some precedent. There's some precedent that's way worse than ours. So you, you, if you want to say that, that's that's how I'm feeling about the Reds. There is something that could happen, maybe, but I'm not, I'm not buying. Yeah, I will say they did pick up a game and a half this week uh, on the wild card. They're only four and a half out. Um so, you know, I, they're, the Marlins, I think, really helped to bolster uh, their record this week, for sure. So, um, but we also played the Brewers, who you and I both said, hey, we need at least one win. So, uh, we'll get to that here shortly as well. But um, there are teams falling off right now. Uh, I will say, giving you a quick look at the uh, wild card, the Diamondbacks and the Padres are on Fire. The Padres might be one of the scariest wild card teams I can remember in a while. Their hitting is coming together. Their bullpen is one of the best in baseball, and their starting pitching is starting to look good. The Diamondbacks are hitting the absolute crap out of the ball. Corbin Carroll has went from being benched to being in the three hole last that I saw. Joe, both teams are eight and two. Um, they are looking pretty secure. It's that last wild card spot that nobody seems to want. Uh, the Braves are falling off a cliff. The Mets can't find consistency. The Cardinals are much better than they should be record-wise. They've done what the Reds can't do and win close games. That's the only reason why they're in this, because otherwise they are uh, one of the worst teams uh, in baseball in terms of their run differential. Uh, The Giants seemingly are hanging around, and so are the Cubs and the Reds. The Pirates, Joe, since we last talked, uh, they lost every single game this week. They've lost seven straight now. Uh, they are 1-9 in, in their last 10 games. They have dropped below the Reds by a half game. Nationals, Rockies, and Marlins are still out uh, of the of the hunt. So, um, yeah, Joe, I mean, it is, it is weirdly still conceivable that the Reds could make a run. Uh, they need to have some things go right for them. Uh, I think Joe's mentality is safer for your mental... Uh, I am still fighting for them a little bit here and there. I know I've said it's over. It is probably over for the Reds. But for some reason, none of these teams like above them seemingly want to do anything either. So all it takes is for the Reds to go on a very short run. I'm talking like a five-game win streak, Joe. And next thing you know, they are uh, right in it, probably within two games of the wild card. So uh, we will have to see what happens here. But... um, with the Braves, Mets, Cardinals, Giants, and Cubs all in front of them, I will be honest with you, and I think the Reds can be better than all of those teams. I think you would agree with me. Even in their current iteration, I think they have the ability to be better than those teams. Whether or not they will be is a whole other question. But that will lead us into the question of the day. What does Ty France, in your mind, have to do to win the job for 2025? Let us know in the comments below. Let us know on Twitter. You can find our Twitter accounts uh, on the YouTube channel, which you should also head over to and like and subscribe if you uh, are feeling kind. Uh, We would appreciate it. Let's head into what was a pretty okay week for the Reds. Uh, We started off here, Joe, Monday night against the Marlins, a 10-3 win. Nick Martinez was the one who ended up getting the, the call, Joe. 
Uh, and he went five innings, four hits, five strikeouts, no earned runs. Uh, it was Jacob Junis who struggled yet again. I don't know why he's struggling since coming over to the Reds, but uh, seemingly he is not aligning with the uh, with the catchers of the Reds or something is going on with them. But um, the Reds were just hit the absolute crap out of poor Munoz. Uh, he didn't even last four innings. Ellie had two home runs. Uh, Noel V. Marte had a home run. Uh, Ty France also got his first big league home run with the Reds which was awesome, uh, and the team just hit. Ellie was very close to hitting for the cycle, uh, also had four hits that night. Uh, it was a wonderful night. Ty France with three hits as well. We love seeing that. You head into Tuesday night, 8-2 win for the Reds. Ellie with uh, two doubles. Stevenson with a home run, and Ty France with back-to-back home runs for the Reds. Uh, Lodolo was great as well. He's still not been sharp. Apparently that blister's really been a bit of a problem. Uh, they think that's been really affecting his slider, but he's still battling six innings, uh, two earned runs, three walks, seven strikeouts. Um, he's still looking pretty solid. Uh, the Reds were able to take it to Miami. Then they lose a weird one on Wednesday, six to four. Joe, as you always said, there's always that weird game. A- Andrew Abbott um, gives up three home runs. He is home run prone. We are going to talk a little bit about that here later. But six earned runs. The bullpen held it down. Junis struggled a tiny bit, but still was able to get out of it with no runs given up. Uh, Ty Steve had two doubles. Friedel had a big grand slam. Uh, It was really the grand slam that hurt Andrew Abbott as well, uh, along with two solo home runs. But um, it was an unfortunate loss for the Reds, one that you really hoped that maybe they could come back and do something uh, and win that game. But they were unable to get to a very bad Marlins bullpen. Then the Reds... Scared the crap out of every Reds fan uh, with a tie game going into uh, the ninth inning. Uh, We go to the 10th, and the Reds just exploded. Uh, They were able to score seven runs, um, mostly off of Ramirez. Uh, Hunter Green was great. Six innings, three runs given up. Two walks, five strikeouts. His ERA lowered to a 2-9, Joe. Or actually, I guess it went up. Uh, after this start, um, even only giving up three home run or three runs, excuse me, no home runs. Uh, but the Reds were able to come back. They were able to work their way through this one, uh, even though it was not exactly a great game for them. Then they headed to Milwaukee. Big loss. Carson Spires uh, struggled mightily, gave up eight runs, all eight runs on the first three innings of this one. He did settle down uh, seven strikeouts, two walks, but the big home runs. Uh, to Willie Adamas uh, and Bryce Terang were too much for him. Spencer Steer did hit on run, and so did Fairchild to at least give the Reds a slight fighting chance. But uh, it was those early innings that would get to him. Um, yet again, uh, since I was calling out Jacob Junis, he had another good inning <laughs> of work against his former team. Uh, then a really rough one. Nick Martinez goes seven innings, Joe. One hit, seven strikeouts. Uh, it was Tony Santion, who's been very reliable so far since coming back, uh, gives up the one home run to Reese Hoskins. That would be the end of it for the Reds. They could not uh, get to uh, to Myers, Piamps, and Devin Williams, who had just returned uh, to get his first save of the year. Uh, only three hits. TJ Friedel, Spencer Steer, and Ty France for the Cincinnati Reds in a really rough game there. But they came back and they fought back on Sunday. Um, after two quick runs were given up by Nick Lodolo at the beginning, he would settle down to five and a third innings, um, only giving up three runs. Uh, one of them off of Buck Farmer, unfortunately, uh, blowing the save there, but four strikeouts, one home run. Ty Stevenson would have a big home run to put the Reds up. Uh, Santiago Espinal continues to hit Joe. Uh, he had two RBIs as well, raising his batting average to 249. The Reds would end up coming out on top of this one um, off of a sack fly uh, and the bullpen would hold it down. Sam Mole, uh, Emilio Pagan, welcome back, comes back, uh, does give up a walk, but gets out of the inning with a double play. And Alexis Diaz looked honestly, probably one of his best saves of the year. In my opinion, two strikeouts looked back to being unhittable uh, and the Reds were able to run away with one win, um, which is all we were hoping for. And this is why, Joe, I was hoping for one more win in that Marlins series. This is why I really wanted it. And you thought maybe if they went on Saturday as well, if the Reds found a way to go 2-1 and one against the Brewers, man, guys, like 
they're three and a half games out right now. That's how big of a game that that 1-0 was, right? Um, their one-run records have been awful this year. Uh, I think it's like 10 and 23 or something like that. Um, it is it is abysmal. Uh, it was big that they got the win yesterday in one run, but uh, they are just not getting it done in close games. And I think that's ultimately going to be their Achilles heel. If the Reds even find a way, Joe, to be close to 500, they win five more of those games, uh, they are sitting in the wild card spot by a half game at this point. That is how significant that is. Now, law of averages says that these things will turn around. I don't know how much more time you have for these laws of averages to play out this season, but that is what they say. What were your thoughts on this weekend? And then we got to dive into this new Brewers rivalry that I think is really starting to form for the Reds. Yeah, this week unfolded pretty much as I expected. I, you know, three, three one for the Marlins, one, two for the Brewers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Marlins, I don't take any pride or statistics, and I think this will foreshadow what we're going to talk about soon. Uh, anything that happens against the Marlins, I don't take seriously. They are a glorified AAA team right now. Mm-hmm. If that, honestly, to be honest, might not even be that. Um, so good to get the job done, but, you know, something will always go wrong. And then the Brewers, I mean, we can't beat them worth anything. So it's it's very, very tough uh, for this team for some reason to beat the Brewers. It's it's even seems like it's gone back for the last couple of years and even before, but it just feels like the Brewers are the team that's always been the thorn in the side for us for at least this iteration of the Reds in the last five years or so. Yeah, it's been really weird. I'm looking this up now because I meant to do this before, but I kind of I kind of forgot. So um, right now against the Brewers, we are three and six this year, which is, uh, I guess, a little bit better than I would have thought, if I'm being honest with you. Uh, but this, the, this Reds team is really kind of propped up against bad teams uh to be honest with you i know they have winning records against some good teams but um you know three and oh against the angels who aren't very good six and one against the rockies five and two against the marlins uh and then that white Sox series obviously they went three and oh as well so um you know they are taking care of business against some bad teams i mean they are a combined 17 and three against teams that we would say are not very good. Um, but then, you know, you have weird records against the Nationals. They're 2-4 and four against. Um, it's just, it, it does feel like they are having some weird games. They're having some weird Achilles heels against certain teams. Um, and it's been, it's been a bit of a struggle, I think, uh, for the Reds against some of these teams. And we, we, I guess maybe we'll find out later this season what's been going on behind the scenes. But it just feels... It feels weird, man. It's just been unfortunate for this team. Um, and I really hoped, like, when I saw the game on Friday, I was like, oh, this is going to be bad. And then the game on Saturday, I was like, okay, like, this, is, this isn't this is terrible. Like, maybe this could be something good for the Reds. Unfortunately, that has not been the case, Joe. So, um, you know, the Reds have gotten better, man. It's just, I'm looking back right now. That May, a 33% win-loss is just awful. Every other month, the Reds have been above 500 every other month this season. So uh, most of the time, not by much one game in April and June, but two in July and they're 500 right now. But uh, it's been, uh, it has been a bit of a struggle to say the least for the Reds. And I want to ask you, do you think that the Brewers are the new Cardinals? Cause it does feel like the Reds have played uh, the Cardinals pretty decently over the last few years. I think since they've kind of had that regime change, like the newer players come in in like 2020 or so um, it has felt like the Cardinals have not been, as big of a thorn in our side um, as well we're used to. We are three and four against them this year. Um, weirdly, we are outscoring them like we do pretty much everybody, twenty-seven to twenty-four. Uh, big series against them this week, Joe. But we're like, do you see this Brewers team as more of a Cardinals uh, like of the past of the last twenty years or so? Uh, not, not in the sense of the rivalry. I- I don't think there's much blood between the Reds and Brewers. Um, you know, a lot of our fights within the division have been Cardinals, been Pirates, been Cubs. We've had a little tiffs in the past. I'd say the Brewers uh, are the team that we probably had the least amount of issues with. I know someone will pull up some random clip of us getting into a fight with them five years ago. But just overall, it seems like we have less beef with them. In terms of, like, the other team that always comes to town and I feel like we may not have a shot to beat them, yeah, I do think they're like the Cardinals in that regard because that's how the Cardinals were, were you know, early 2000s to 2010s. 
And, uh, you know, we had a little bit of rivalry with them that made it different, but I don't know. I really respect what the Brewers have done um, this season specifically. I mentioned last week that, like, they're really fortunate. They haven't had many position players get hurt uh, other than Yelich, obviously. Uh, but they, they just hit the ball, keep on hitting the ball. Pitchers get hurt. They keep on finding new guys like Frankie Montas, bring him in and everything. And they, they are setting themselves up for success. Uh, despite being a team that trades away good players every once in a while and has to restock. And it seems like in that regard, they also feel like the Cardinals where, you know, the last couple of years, the Cardinals have gotten Goldschmidt, they've gotten Arenado in trades, but for the most part, they're a homegrown team. They go develop their players. And it seems like that's what the Brewers are doing. They're going and trading Josh Hader a couple of years ago and saying, hey, we just can't afford him, but we can't afford young prospects in a couple of years who will help us. So there's a lot of similarities. I, I would say this is the one big difference is I don't think there's as much hatred for the Brewers as there is the Cardinals back in the day. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. They just remind me of the fact that they're just able to always be in it. They always feel like they are a solid team. Um, this year, I really didn't think they were going to be as good. I think I said that straight up. I, I really didn't. I thought uh, maybe the Cubs would be a little bit better. Um, I expected it to be the Cardinals and the Pirates at the bottom of the division. I didn't expect Paul Skeens to do what he's done, but I think that's kind of worn off. He gave up, uh, I think he's given up like six runs in his last two games. So, um, you know, he's at least coming back down to earth a little bit. His ERA is still only like a 2-3 or something. But, you know, I'm looking at this show all time. Do you... Is there, well, how would I, I'm going to rephrase this. How many teams in our division of the four do the Reds have an all-time winning percentage against? So Cubs, Pirates, Brewers, and Cardinals. Of those four, how many do you think we have a winning percentage against? Three. Zero. Not one. Aha. Uh-huh. The Reds, the Reds are 18 games under 500 against the Chicago Cubs. Uh, the Pirates, they are 33 games under 500. Um, although they've obviously played a lot of games against those teams, so their win percentage is still 49. percent So not too bad um, against the Brewers. 48.6 uh, percent. We are 12 games under against them and against the Cardinals. We are 162 games under 500 all time against the St. Louis Cardinals. So, um, most of these are on the road, to be clear. Like, we have a 41% win percentage on the road against the Cardinals, Joe. Um, so, you know, that's pretty, uh, pretty abysmal. Um, at home, we actually have a 52% win percentage. Um, same against the Cubs, 53 and 46 percent against them uh on the road so uh just not been a great road team uh for a while it would seem like and uh it is interesting to note i was trying to find how we've done against the brewers over the last five seasons i was not able to find that quickly but it was interesting to point out that the reds have no winning uh percentages none that are above 50 percent against any of the four teams in their divisions um so very sad very sad to say the least, but I would agree. I would say the Cardinals are still, I think our true rival. I think that's how most Reds fans see it, but I do think if the Cardinals continue to trend downward and the Reds continue to trend upward uh, and the Brewers continue to just kind of dominate the division at the top, uh, I think things could change once the Reds actually get good enough to battle against them for the division crown. Um, so we will have to keep that in mind. Um, I wanted to talk about this real quickly too, Joe. I don't know if it's this way against or for other teams. I remember watching the Yankees for a really long time. Now they were obviously very different. Uh, I've not watched them as much over the last ten years, but for the first ten or twenty years of my life, I, I watched a lot of a lot of Yankees games, um, and it felt like they consistently had decent hitting and decent pitching. Never was one necessarily elite. Um, they had times where they were, but it wasn't very consistent. The Reds, for some reason, we can't seemingly do either of them at the same time. It feels like very rare that we have a complete game. I don't know if that's just because we're young, Joe. I don't know if that's because of the manager or the general manager and the way they're putting the team together. I, I've just always wondered this. And it felt like this week was kind of a personification of this issue. But why can't we hit and pitch at the same time in your mind? Oh, it's because of the hitting. I actually don't have money <laughs> problems with pitching this year. I This is a... A team that uh, was built to hit for average. We don't hit for average. And we have so many bad games hitting that if we have one bad game pitching, it skews everything. So I actually don't think we can't hit and pitch at the same time. I think we just can't hit. 
And that's it. That's the whole thing. So we'll have a game where we score eight runs, and that's great. But for the most part, we'll have as in a week, and then we'll have one or two that are just not great, which is what you should expect, especially with a staff that was built on a fourth starter being, you know, for so long, Frankie Montas and, and Carson Spires. That's what you should expect your, your team to do. So, um, yeah, I think the offense is the bigger issue. I think John Sadak said it on the broadcast this weekend. The Reds have the most games in Major League Baseball with three hits or fewer this year, 17. The next closest is the White Sox with 12. The White Sox just came off of a 21-game losing streak, and even if you took their 21-game losing streak out, they would still be in last week, last place in the American League. That's how bad this team is hitting the ball. Um, I, I respect the pitchers, what they've done. Even the bullpen, we've had our issues with their usage, and even specific players, Rob and I both have our favorites and least favorites in the bullpen. It's the hitting. It, it clearly is the hitting. We This is a team that the offense, coming into the year, we should expect to score four or five runs a game. And mm-hmm. there's so many games you just look in our past where it's zero, one, two. That gives our guys no chance. So I, I don't think we can't. I, I don't think we can hit, and I think that's the whole crux of the issue. And they, the reason why it maybe feels like, oh, sometimes when we hit, we can't pitch. Well, if once a week we score eight runs, but the rest of the week we score, you know, one, two per game, that doesn't do anything for you. So I, I really hate our hitters this year. Really hope they can bounce back. There's only a couple that you can rely on. And, yes, it's a very big pitching year for some reason. Uh, we talk about the baseballs changing and everything, but we're still doing bad by everyone else's standards, which is down. So I, I don't get it. I, I think the hitting is a big issue. Yeah, and it is weird because we are like averaging 4.4 runs per game this year, Joe, but it doesn't feel like that, right? Like you go through this weekend and yes, we put up 10, 8, but then 4 and 10. So the Reds did put up, what, uh, 12, 32 runs against the Marlins, but that's a bad team. Against the Brewers, 3, 1, and 4, right? Um, didn't even Didn't even eclipse... Uh, 10 runs in that three game series, but we did it three times against the Marlins. So they're just so inconsistent. They rely too much on the home run ball, which is still very surprising to me, uh, considering, like you said, how the way that this team is built, um, we're almost a top 10 team in baseball in home runs. And the weird part is I don't feel like we're hitting a ton of them at home. You know, like this team is actually pretty decent on the road, Joe. Uh, They are one of the, uh, better teams on the road, uh, I believe, in at least the division. Um, yeah, they, they technically would be cl- like second uh, in the division in terms of they'd be tied with the Pirates uh, in terms of on the road. But like, you know, teams that people really like, like the Braves, 29 and 30, similar record as, as the Reds. Um, you know, even the Diamondbacks are only two, two games, two and a half games up on the Reds on uh, games on the road. Uh, the Giants are nine games under 500 on the road, but people take care of business at home. Uh, and the Reds are 28 and 31 at home, one of the worst records uh, in baseball uh, at home. So it's just like there are just so many things like where the hitting just doesn't seemingly match with the pitching. And weirdly, this team's not playing great at home. Uh, they're not taking care of business at home. It's just a very weird situation. Um, and it leads me into this Abbott and Lodolo, Joe, have both been great at times and bad at times. You and I have talked about, I know I've brought up a a lack of strikeouts for Abbott, which has concerned me a little bit. He's giving up a lot of home runs as well, but he's one of the best pitchers in baseball with runners in scoring position. And I wonder how long that can last. And then for Lodolo, look, the injuries are okay. Like it's seemingly like he's pitching through this, um, this blister situation, which is very annoying, but uh, I, I appreciate the fact that he's not taking the time off because he knows how much time he's lost uh, and this team is, ish, like, in their minds, still trying to fight for a playoff spot. Um, do you worry at all maybe that it's their usage or, like, they're just there are very glaring weaknesses to these two players right now. And while I think they're still young and they can obviously learn these things and, and change them up, uh, Abbott's going to end up leading all of baseball in home runs given up by starting pitchers, most likely. Um, and Nick Lodolo's ERA has ballooned to almost a four at this point. Uh, after he was sitting in the two sevens, two eights for quite a while. Um, do you have any concerns? I'm not saying that I do. I'm trying to play both sides here. Like they've obviously been great throughout yeah. most of the year as well, but 
Uh, do you have concerns at all about either of these two players? I know we've been talking about the elite three uh, of the starting pitching, but right now it's been kind of the elite one uh, and a little bit of Carson Spires. Yeah, I don't really have too many issues with these guys or any worries for the future. Abbott is a guy who's a contact pitcher. He's going to give up home runs. That's just how it's going to be. Um, but he's pitched very well despite that. Like if you if you you can maybe next year work on limiting it and getting it down to I don't know, twenty home runs given up. Like he's going to be a better pitcher for it. He's still the least experienced out of these guys. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Hunter Green and Nickel Dolly, who've had more time to get up here into the pros and, and do this. So I have very few issues with him. I know a lot of Reds fans are very mad because they see the home runs and then they get mad about it. And I've seen a lot of people on Twitter say we need to trade him. I, I still think it's good to have different guys who do different things at your rotation. Whether you have Hunter Green with the power, you have Abbott with the placement, Oladolo with the nasty stuff. So for, for Abbott, I'll say not really concerned. I hope he can work on getting the home runs down, but it is just his second season. And, and I think he's shown with his 3.7 ERA, he's, he's done a solid job this year despite giving up the home runs. Mm -hmm. Something to watch out for for sure, but not really worried about it. And Oladolo, the thing I worry about with him, I think he's a good pitcher when he's healthy. There always seems to be another issue with him health-wise. And that's what, what really bothers me is, like, now it's the blister and he's trying to pitch through it. And I do think that affects him mentally of, like, he's had some of the injuries when he's come back from it. It's like, oh, I got to get over through five innings. I got to get to the next step. And I think that gets to him. So I my worry there is that the injuries will continue to pile up. It, you know, is it, is it an arm? Is it a leg? Is it a shoulder? Is it a blister? I mean, it just it seems like through Ladola's career there's been something – you know, every couple weeks, it feels like. I know that's probably not 100% true, but that's what it feels like. I worry that he will be injured and have to keep on coming back and get over the injury rather than focusing on just being a better pitcher in the future. So my worries are pretty limited for, for Abbott, for Lodolo. It's mostly about the injuries because when he's on and healthy, he's been great. I, I just think that everything's been like kind of like keeping him down this year, the injuries, are, the injuries have for sure. Okay. Yeah, no, I feel the same way, to be clear. I do think that I worry a little bit about Abbott's inability to strike out people um, compared to last year. I would like to see him either develop another pitch over the off season, or I'd like to see him get in a little bit better shape, whether that's being stronger, a little more lean, whatever that ends up being like stronger legs, upper body core, whatever it needs to be. Um, Cause I'd love to see him add another mile or two an hour to his fastball, Joe. Um, I think that when you have a guy who likes to live up in the zone, I don't want him to lose his control. So I'm not saying he does like a full drive line thing where he adds, you know, he's getting up there to 97 or something like that. Cause I think he's young enough. And uh, honestly, like I think there's uh, the ability for him to do something like that, but I don't want to see that. I want him to stay within his own means, but I do want to see him add a little bit more cause he's not even averaging a strikeout per inning right now. Um, and his whip has gone up pretty substantially. Um, it's two at one, three, one, which is, Fernando Cruz levels um, and his batting average against is a 239 right now. So I have some concerns with him. I think that there are things that can be fixed. Um, and for Lodolo, it is truly just injuries for me. I, I just wanted to bring this up because I have seen a lot of people on Twitter worrying about both of them. Um, I do think both are fine. They're both very young. I'm not overly worried about them. Um, but I, you know, I do wonder should the Reds make a three game playoff? Do you start Nick Martinez? I mean, do you consider it? That dude has been unbelievable for a while. Uh, I'm not saying that I, again, agree with that, but I'm putting it out there because I saw it on Twitter. Do you do you consider starting him? I would say no. I think you leave him in terms of you start one of the big three, and then if one of them struggle, then you have Nick Martinez come in and you know kind of pitch the rest of the starting innings that you would want, um, to be clear. But he has been pretty outstanding right now, and it's so weird because it's like, Carson had one really bad game. Like this last like start was, was pretty detrimental to his ERA and everything else. But you know, I think you have these five and I think you're fine going through the rest of the season. And I think the bullpen is starting to kind of find its spot. Uh, weirdly enough, bringing back Pagan gives me a little bit of hope that they'll be able to be all right. But you know, Sam Mole and Tony Santion along with uh, Diaz at the back, I think have been okay. So um We'll have to see how things go with the rest of this pitching staff. But, you know, like you said, they've been pretty good for the most part. And I don't think it's time to worry yet about Abbott and Lodolo. Um, I think of the rest of the season, though, if they start giving up four runs a game or something like that, five runs a game, uh, then I think there is cause for concern. But for right now, I'm going to say no. I did want to give... Yeah, there, there's... Oh, sorry. 
Yeah, there, there is a there is a people might be wondering like oh Abbott fell off a cliff last year at the end of the year maybe we should worry about that this year and that might be happening too a little bit but uh, do have to say home runs are up for him this year based on last year last year he pitched 21 games this year he pitched 23 he gave up 16 home runs last year 24 this year so far uh, and the strikeouts are down but the ERA is also down so let's let's see if he keeps the ERA down and like if he can like hey I give up a solo home run because I'm being aggressive with hitters when no one's on base. And he keeps on giving up yeah. runs like that, then it's not as big of an issue. So I, I do maybe worry about him, um, you know, us not using him longer in the last couple of years to build up that stamina for the end of the year. I will say that I think for all the guys, I really want to see them, um, you know, pitch past their limits this year without being taxed. But also, it's it's tough to pitch when there's so much pressure. Like you might get one or two runs of run support, and these guys are going out there dealing. And you know, that, it'd be nice to have a relaxing start where your guys score you five where you can just kind of go deal. And I haven't really had that opportunity a lot of games too. So I'm excited to see if we can do that near the end of the year to get these guys back on track to where they should be. Yeah, I completely agree. And and it is true. Like most of Abbott's home runs, I bet you over half of them have been solo shots. So um, that's, you know, look, that, that that is what it is. You take those out, uh, even half those, and his ERA is in a really good spot. And he's probably sadly won like two or three more games for the team. It's It's been the margins Joe that have really hurt us this year. And um, that's why I think fans worry. I do want to give a quick kudos to Tyler Stevenson, Joe. I think from what it sounds like, a lot of the pitchers are a lot happier with him. Um, He has really found his power over the last month. Uh, It's been really nice to see because I think we always thought that he had that, but he's dealt with injuries. He had a full season last year, but he was just okay. Um, this year, though, he is doing very, very well. Uh, 15 home runs this year. His average is up to right around 250. But his OPS has been outstanding as well. He is tied for first in home runs in the National League, which I think is outstanding. Um, and he's second in OPS uh, in terms of players with actually a decent amount of games. You look around, you've got players like Wilson Contreras, Will Smith, um, William Contreras, right? Like they're all doing very well, uh, at different points as well. But, um, it feels like Ty Steve is starting to come into his own in my mind, Joe. Uh, it feels like he is starting to figure things out. All of his defensive metrics are up from, from past years. His hitting is up. He's still only like 27, which I know may seem old right now, but like you got another good six or seven years in him before he really starts to kind of fall off most likely. Um, at least five, I would say, if you really wanted to be tough on him. But um, he's a leader in the clubhouse, and I just wanted to give him some kudos because he had a huge home run yesterday. Um, he's consistently had some big home runs. Uh, I remember when he first came up, we were like talking about how clutch this guy was, and he had two years, you know, really 2022 and 2023, where just we were like, yeah, I don't really know. What is this guy going to be? Um, they have found a way to keep him healthy at the beginning of the season. He's playing a lot more often. I know that was something that you wanted to see as well as I did. Um, you know, he's going to go over the hundred game mark, you know, knock on wood, uh, you know, here this season, which is, uh, which is nice to see that back to back years. But I really just feel like he is, he is finding it. His, his, uh, what is this? His hard hit ball is up. His, uh, what is it? His exit velocity, uh, is up this year as well. Um, it's his highest by almost a full mile an hour, uh, than he's ever had in his entire career. Um, his barrel percentage is up almost 3%. Um, the sweet spot is up, uh, or, or right about the same. His launch angle is up. Every single thing batting wise is basically up and he's able to do it to all fields is I think what is most interesting to me about him. He doesn't strike out very much. He walks a decent amount. He doesn't chase bad pitches. Like I just feel like he is really coming into his own to be one of the top 10, at least maybe even top five catchers in baseball here. Maybe not this year, but I think in the next couple years, we are going to see that with Tyler Stevenson. Um, and, you know, I think he's going to kind of be able to come into his own, but I wanted to give him a little shout out and get your thoughts on him as well, Joe. Yeah, borderline top 10 catcher in the sport right now. You could argue he's in, you could argue he's out. He's right on the line there pretty much. There's a lot of good catchers right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, But there's also a lot of catchers who don't hit the ball, which is nice to have one who does. He's on pace to play about 125 this year. 
you know, next year when we have no one else hitting, let's not put someone who's not hitting in the DH spot. Let's put Tyler Stevens, 240 against righties. Like, that's great. That's that's fine for us through this team especially. So that power has been good. Um, again, I would say, as you said, Rob, maybe next year can push towards the top 10, towards the top five catchers in baseball. It's really uh, it's been misused this year in different ways, and I would love to see him get more towards that 140 mark just because I, I do think he's, you can give him a day off and play him as DH. He yeah. can still provide a lot of value for this team just the way that we've hit. I mean, he's he's probably one of the more consistent hitters on the team this year, top two or three, I would say, and it doesn't have those long streaks and those long lulls where he doesn't get hit. So I would love to see him uh, be, uh, especially while he's still somewhat young. I mean, obviously 27 is not the youngest for catchers on their knees, but I would love to see him be used more often and be a bigger part of this team, uh, you know, much like Jonathan India has been in the last couple of years. Well, and what I was going to say too is I think, you know, they he ha- he doesn't have as much wear and tear because he has been injured so much over the last few years. And I know it sounds stupid, but like, he hasn't played as many games, so he's not going to have as much wear and tear on those knees. And I do think that he can move into the DH role at some point. We'll have to see. I think there are a lot of good hitters moving forward, Joe, that I, I will have to see. They may take that spot more consistently. But um, if he is a guy that can hit well against both sides of the plate, um, you may just need that. You just may need it. So um, I do think it was time to give Ty a little bit of credit because uh, I think he's I think he is finding himself. I think he is becoming that next really solid Reds catcher. Um, I, I also a quick shout out. Uh, Tucker Barnhart got signed this week uh, to a minor league deal for the Reds. So I yes. uh, forgot to put that in there, but I just remembered that as well. Um, you know, I think that weirdly enough, that gives me a lot of confidence for this team moving forward. Cause if Luke Maley gets hurt, if Ty Steve gets hurt. Uh, you can bring back Tucker, who has worked with a lot of these young pitchers. He's not hitting very well anymore, which is not a surprise. A lot of people think that this is actually them bringing him in to have a coaching role in the future, Joe. Um, I don't know if you've heard that or if you believe that, um, but he is nearing probably the end of his career, at least uh, hitting-wise. Although we saw the same thing with Jacob Stallings, and now he's randomly hitting 260 for the first time in his career. He's you know, a notorious like 180 batter, so... Um, we'll see if maybe Tucker can have that kind of revival at an older age, but I think it was nice for the fan base to bring him back. And apparently, uh, Stevenson was the first one to text him, um, and welcome him back. And so he's hoping obviously that he'll get called up one day. I think, I think for now, to be honest, I think Luke Maley's fine, but, um, should we need that third catcher? I'm glad that it's somebody like Tucker Barnhart instead of Austin wins or Eric Yang, uh, if I'm being completely honest with you right now. So um, shout out to him as well. Last topic here before we head into our previews. So far, Ty France has been a nice addition. Joe, with the Reds, he's batting 250. Now, normally, you'd be like, that's not very good. For this Reds team, that's pretty solid. I think you and I would both take that in a heartbeat uh, for the whole season. That that would be nice, to be honest with you. Um, and I wanted to give a shout out to Santiago Espinal as well, who is having uh, arguably the best year of his entire career career other than that all-star year um you could say that maybe he's been better even this year he's played multiple different positions including left field uh and while his obp is low because he's just not a walk guy um he is just hitting the absolute crap out of the ball and even when you look back at his and or his uh all-star season he's got more home runs um he's striking out less actually He's stolen more bases. I think his defense has been solid. Uh, I think if he had played a similar amount of games, uh, his he'd have more hits at this point as well. Um, look, I think he's doing a really good job, and I wanted to give kudos to both of them. And then I wanted to ask you, in your mind, Joe, are they locked in for a bench spot next season? Both are under control for next year. I think that's why the Reds added them. I have Stu Fairchild and Jake Fraley penciled in, as you already know. I think they are really nice fourth and fifth outfielders. Um, I think Stu Fairchild especially has been really, really, really good over the last few weeks, uh, hitting-wise, and I think all season he's been an awesome defender. But do you think that they are, like, for sure pushing for at least a bench spot? Uh, And as we talked about, what does Ty France have to do in your mind to win the job in 2025? Yeah, this is 
question because I do think if this team is going to compete, they probably will cannot have all these guys return. It's just a matter of numbers on the roster. So if they sign a couple of free agents, sign two free agents who are batters. I mean, obviously that that squeezes the numbers out. So that makes it tough. Uh, I will. I'll start with Espinal. I love the guy from the start. I love the acquisition. Uh, he did start slow, but also it was tough for him. I think to play not regularly and he get his batting average up and then he got used to it and now he's still not playing like every day but he's getting enough at bats where he's used to it he's batting 249 he had some errors early in the season mm -hmm. the one thing i loved about him is when he played he was like the one guy on the team that you could count on if you need a sack fly he's gonna get you a sack fly if you need to yep. hit the ball to the right side to move a runner over to third he did it a lot and that was like the little things that really impressed me so i know a lot of people got on him early for his play love him as a backup would not be surprised rob if they don't sign a third baseman if he gets into the mix as possibly starting third baseman, if Jamer starts at first uh, next season. So that's just something to think about. Like Marte, if he doesn't start hitting the ball, maybe Espinal is a guy we got for cheap and could be a guy who gets some playing time. I do think I would lock him into the bench because of his versatility at the very least. But if he does show the upside of being able to start, hey, why, who are we to argue? If someone hits, I'm not going to argue with him. Um, and I'll go to Stu Fairchild and Jake Fraley. Stu Fairchild, again, he might get squeezed out for some acquisitions, but he does hit left-handers for defense has been fine. Jake Fraley, I don't know what to expect with him. Uh, he's a guy who deserves, I think, to probably be on the team over guys like Will Benson next year. But I don't know how much they like him. It seems like they haven't played him as much as maybe they should, at least in my mind, with how his batting average is this year, even though he does lose the power. Um, I would say that'd be a fine bench player for next year. Don't know if he's going to be on the team just if they add more people. And then last, Ty France. For me, way too early to say he's locked into this bench. A lot of his stats are bolstered by playing Miami. He had three hits in the first game, one hit in the second game. Uh, other than that, he did struggle against the Giants. He did okay against the Brewers. Um, so I, I'm still not really buying into that. I don't know if he, if they're going to be okay with him, the player that he is. He's a first baseman that doesn't provide much power. I know I'm the guy who calls for average, and he has hit for average throughout his career typically teams want a first baseman who has some pop in their bat he also doesn't hit lefties very well especially this year at least uh 191 batting average against lefty starters that's where i think your second question comes in here rob if he wants to make this team on the bench he needs to be able to hit lefties because that's one of our biggest weaknesses and he just hasn't done it this year so that's something that i think he'll have to improve far from locking him in from the bench i don't take the Marlin stats seriously, so I want to see a couple more series before we really see what he can do. Um, good that he good that he played well against the Marlins. That's awesome. But I get the they've traded away, especially how many pitchers they traded away. So excited to see what he can do the next couple next couple weeks here when they play some good competition. See if he can keep that momentum going. Uh, but yeah, I think hitting lefties is gonna be the biggest thing for him because that seems to be something that we can't do, uh, as evidenced by the no header I saw last week against Blake Snell, <laughs> which is. Fair, and then they only had three hits uh, on Saturday as well. So uh, he was one of them, though. I, I will say, I think, for me, I think it's going to really depend on the recovery of CES and what they think, if maybe he needs more time down in AAA or not. Um, it is interesting to see as well, because like you said, he doesn't add much defensively. I think his, I think his home run totals are actually a little under- what they probably would be in, uh, with a team like Cincinnati, uh, just because he did play in Seattle for so long. I could see him being a 25 home run guy, which in today's baseball game, a 25 home run guy is considered a power hitter nowadays. We're not getting the 30, 40 hit, you know, home run hitters as often anymore. Uh, even though for years, that was the only thing that was taught uh, was, you know, home run walk or strikeout. Uh, it just feels like it is, um, less and less that we are seeing 30 plus home run guys, uh, at least on a consistent basis, like we were in the past. Um, so I don't know. We'll have to see. He could be a guy who's interesting to me. Um, I think Santiago Espinal absolutely has locked in a spot for me so far. Uh, to be honest with you, not only does he hit pretty well, uh, but he can play the fact that he can play second, short third, and now left field, I think makes him probably the most valuable bench piece they have. Um, and dude, I know Jake Fraley's not getting much time. It is strange to me. I, I, I feel like he's going to have to be on the way out because I think he's just going to be disgruntled by his playtime. Um, but I do think that Stu Fairchild needs to stick around. I think his batting average, uh, I don't know what it is against lefties right now, Joe. Um, maybe you can check on that. I, I probably should have brought it up, but I was actually going to do a quick defense of our boy, Noel V. Marte. He is, we said, if he could hit 250 for the rest of the season, that we would be very happy. Um, since we talked about that, he is hitting 233. He's seven for 30, um, which isn't great, but 
Uh, maybe he's working his way there. And then he's made some really good defensive plays lately as well after he struggled early on. Um, I know pretty much everybody's hyping him up, including the Cowboy, who I think is probably the hardest on most players. Uh, but uh, I've been hearing a lot of good stuff from him when I've been listening on the radio as well about Marte's development. And they feel like he's starting to kind of hit the ball really well. Uh, apparently a lot of his outs over the last week um, and some of the games I wasn't able to watch uh, were loud outs. Uh, like a lot of hard hit balls. So they're starting to think that he may be turning it around as well. So we'll have to see with him. But I do think Stu Fairchild and Santiago Espinal, at least for me, are guys that you want to lock in for next year. Because if nothing else, uh, Stu Fairchild gives you a great chance. Uh, he's really good at pinch hitting. He's great against lefties. And he's probably maybe the best defensive outfielder we have right now. Joe, I think it's between him and TJ. So, uh, you know, taking out Spencer Steer late in the game when you're up uh, to put Stu Fairchild in makes a lot of sense to me. So uh, I think those are two that I would lock in, and I'll be interested to see what they do with Ty France and Jake Fraley as they both have them, I believe, under contract uh, in terms of arbitration for next year. Yeah, my, my hope is that maybe all of them but Espinal are gone, and that's nothing against the players on the bench, but I really do yeah. hope they actually could be aggressive this offseason and go get some guys that move other guys to the bench or maybe put some other guys in platoon situations. That's fair. Uh, but Fairchild, as you mentioned, did, did better than expected this year. He's batting 280 versus Lefters. Uh, you mentioned that he's a best, better pinch hitter than he is probably a starter. 215 against left-handed starting pitchers this year, so he has trouble when it's a starting pitcher for some reason. He actually hits higher against right-handed starters than left-handed starters. So maybe you wow. say, hey, that's like that's kind of weird, but like maybe he is just a pinch hitter next year. Maybe he is a defensive platoon in the late innings. We've had guys on this roster, the 26th man, like Bubba Thompson at the start of last year. I would take Stuart Fairchild over that if he's the 26th man, or Nick Martini, or anyone. So yep. one of the, any of the guys you want to list as the 26th man from the start of the year. So that's something that are there. What Stu Fairchild's done, he's done better than expected. I hate the people who, again, shit on the bench players all the time because Stu doesn't deserve it. San Diego Espinal doesn't deserve it for sure. And like I said, I'm excited to see the other guys uh, moving forward. You mentioned Fraley being, I think his dad was on Twitter complaining about it at one point during this year, uh, which isn't good. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if he like, kind of asked for a trade. I am very surprised they haven't used him more this year. I know the power isn't there, but 278 batting average. Like, you just think about how much that would help us on a consistent basis, getting guys on base. I don't know. I, I think he's had a lot going on in his personal life, too, and he's still showing up and hitting that well. Most of the, I mean, obviously, he's played 84 games, not every game, but that means a lot to me. So I I don't know what the solution is here for him, but right, I do think that uh, some of these guys are, are still auditioning for the roster spots next year. But ultimately, if we sign two free agent bats, that's going to squeeze the numbers down, and, and hopefully we, some of these guys can fight for the last roster spot. Well, and what's interesting about Fraley, too, to be honest, I just wonder if he's just not a part of their plans at all for the future at this point because he's actually batting 282 against lefties. He's 11 for 39, um, including a home run, one of his three home runs. So it's like, it is really interesting. I think this may be part of the problem, Joe. With a guy at second or third base right now, uh, he has two hits this year. Uh, he is two for 26. So, not great. Uh, nice. His batting average with runners in scoring position in general is around 240. So, that may be part of the reason. Um, and they don't want to put him in the leadoff spot as well. So, um, just something of note. Maybe that's part of the reason is like maybe the sabermetrics aren't really valuing Jake Fraley. Uh, and he's not necessarily a great defensive outfielder either. Um, he's a very average to below average defensive out outfielder. So, and may the the bigger problem to me, and the weird part is, is like, as much as Will Benson has been a problem, uh, they they showed the lowest WRC runs uh, created or whatever um, in baseball for like each team, and Benson was still like top fourteen in baseball in terms of like the Reds' worst player technically, uh, still being a top fourteen player. So like. It is weird that ben Benson is still adding a lot to this team, just not the way that I think you or I would like it. And I think, weirdly, the analytics show that Will Benson's actually a more valuable player, potentially, than Jake Fraley, um, which I think that may be why they keep playing him. It's frustrating to me because I don't agree with that at all. Um, but I, it may be that that's the case. I'm not going to say that's for sure. I haven't looked at what Fraley's you know weighted runs created. I think that's what it is. 
are and like some of these other really deeper stats than just batting average are but like it is wild to me that a guy that's hitting 80 points lower even though he has like I guess 10 more home runs is really worth that much more than Jake Fraley is. And I think it's mainly again, just because I think Fraley just hasn't hit with men in scoring position. I think if he was hitting a little bit better with men in scoring position, I think he would be getting the, 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 the at bats more often, but it feels like he just can't hit unless if it's a clean inning or he's the only guy, uh, you know, coming up with nobody on base. Yeah. I think maybe we're attached to being speed demons too much. And that's why we don't put him in the lead off, but I would love to see, especially with Friedel's injuries uh, this year, I would love to see him in the leadoff spot. I, I think he's a guy who can for power. Just get him on base, you know, put whoever you want behind him and see if you can move him over. I, you know, we've changed, the game has changed from different times. And like, we know that right now, like everyone's trying to take advantage of the speed we have on the team. In years past, he's been trying to hit home runs, one home run would win the game. And maybe that's still kind of the, the MO of, of Major League Baseball teams, but I still resign to the fact that getting on base is more important. He's mm -hmm. got the highest batting average on the team for for someone who's at least played eighty games. And we can look at everyone else. He's not doesn't qualify for any of the main, you know statistics leaders. But why not? I mean, let's get someone who gets on base at the top of the order rather than guys who are struggling. Yeah, you could say India when he was on that tear maybe could have been the leadoff hitters too, or Friedel when he's healthy. But you know, I remember we had remember the year we had Scott Hatterberg. He was hitting first. He's as slow as anyone in the league, and he was hitting first for us <laughs> after those. A couple, of, a couple of years after those A's teams for Moneyball, if you guys are interested in that. But uh, that's what I would have done personally. Like, I do love that we have speed. But if you don't hit, I don't know if you can give up such a valuable spot in the batting order to someone not hitting. And there has been times where we've had guys high in the order who just aren't hitting. And I think that would have been a fair compromise for a guy who doesn't hasn't hit with runners in scoring position, who hasn't had much power, but does get on base when we've needed guys to get on base. So, that I don't know. That's something to think about for the future. Maybe Maybe we're buying into the speed stuff a little bit too much. Yeah, we'll have to look at that too. I mean, it is interesting. I'm going to quickly look at his um, his baseball savant page, and my goodness, it is it is pretty bad. Uh, I will say his mm -hmm. uh, exit velocity is uh, in the one percentile. Uh, his barrel is in the three percent, and his hard hit is also in the three percent. Um, so, I mean, he is not hitting for any power. Weirdly enough, his bat speed is better than people like uh, than Tyler Stevenson's even. But I don't know. And he apparently chases bad pitches. He's actually been an above average uh, fielder, uh, which is a surprise to me. But um, his exit velocity even last year was apparently in the bottom of baseball. He's never had an average exit velocity of eight, above 85.3, which is three miles an hour lower than all of baseballs. So look, there, there comes a point, Joe, where it's like, yeah, you kind of just got to work through it. But um you know, the other sad thing is, Joe, uh, he has yet to hit a baseball over... Secure, that's uh, right. Let me see here. 371 feet this year. That is his farthest hit ball. Uh, he has only technically had, if you're in Great American Ballpark only, um, he would still only have five home runs compared to the three. So, it's tough. I'm... It's I'm, tough. I'm it with you. Tough. I think I think the advanced advanced analytics would say to not play him, but at this point where we've run through every option, you might as why well. Why not? The guy's still yeah. hitting 270. Yeah, I'm just thinking like what you know, like we've come so far with analytics that like it takes a lot of decisions away. But at a certain point, like what if a guy gets like that analytics will tell you guys can't get hot, right? Like the guys can't go on streaks. Streaks are nothing like they they don't mean anything, right? I believe you can go on a streak. I believe you can get hot. I believe you can get in the zone. I believe that Sometimes the batting average can be improved by luck, but when you're playing so many games, if your batting average is still high, you're doing something right, even if it isn't the one percent. Even if it isn't the one percent of bat speed, or excuse me, uh, barrel rate uh, or exit velocity that you mentioned. So, I, don't know, I just would like to see a different change. Yeah, like Will Benson has more home runs, but he's also played like 16 more games than him. And yeah, I think Will Benson's more naturally talented as an athlete, but yes. I just would love to see us hit more, especially when we talked about. Our pitcher's not getting run support, and can, why can't we hit and pitch at the same time? We have a guy on the bench who just isn't getting the chance, and I get, like, some of this stems from the off-field issues. He's a lot to deal with with his daughter and also his own injuries coming back, and that's probably why I think are down for advanced statistics. But that's my thing. I, I would like to try him. I would like to see how he does the rest of the year. I would, I would love to retroactively maybe play him more than Will Benson at the start of the year and see how things go, despite the 
some of the like advanced statistics. I mean, War Will Benson's still negative point seven and has been awful. So mm-hmm. like, and Fraley's been to point two, point two or point three. So I, I don't know. I think I think something I would like to try, but it is there is no hundred percent right answer. It is like, hey, let's give this guy a shot because he has good statistics, but we don't think that. I mean, to be honest, if we're expecting things, we don't expect that to hold up. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. I'm I'm looking up Benson real quickly here, Joe, just to see what his. I would love to know what his batting average uh, on balls put in play are. Just to see like if he's really just getting unlucky. Um, uh, no, I mean his batting average on balls put in play is 297. That's not terrible uh, whatsoever. So, um, you know, I think maybe last year was just that he got a lot luckier. He was 391 on batting average on balls put in play. Generally, you want to be in the mid to upper threes. So, like, he's probably batting, like, 20 points, maybe 30 points lower than you would expect. But it's not like he's going to be a 250 to 270 hitter uh, for most of his career. So, um, it is sad to see because I, I do I do like all these players. I think that they all have their areas where I think that they are pretty good. But like you said, I mean, when you're war and everything, it's just – when you're just not that valuable, it, it makes things pretty tough, uh, to be honest with you. And – um, most of the hitters have been not valuable this season. It's really just been Ellie. Then you got Ty and Spencer uh, Steer, who combined don't even have the same war as Ellie does right now. So take that as you will. Um, you know, keep that in mind as we as we work our way through this and we move forward. Um, Joe, I think we'll move off of this one. I think we've put a lot of emphasis on it. I think it's been a good discussion as well. But we got to look at the Cardinals. The Cardinals are barely above us right now uh in the standings it has been uh i think a very weird year for them because i don't think that they're a very good team but they consistently are finding weird ways to win games uh they are currently um three games exactly above the reds uh sitting at 60 and 58 right now um their lineup consists of some uh, combination of these players, uh, Brandon Donovan, Mason Wynn, Alec Burleson, Wilson Contreras, Nolan Arenado, Lars Newtbar, Paul Goldschmidt, Nolan Gorman, Tommy Pham, who they recently traded for. Uh, and then they use a bunch of different players. Um, you know, Brandon Crawford, Victor Scott. Um, I'm trying to think where is his name? I cannot remember. Oh, Pedro Pajes um, as well for catchers. So, a lot of different guys. We're going to be getting Sony Gray back as well uh, against the Reds uh, in his first game against Cincinnati uh, in a while. Um, I, I don't know if he's played against us yet since we traded him away, but he comes back to Cincinnati, a place that uh, you do know that he he loves. Um, look, this team, like I said, Joe, I I don't know that they are really all that good. Uh, I, I I don't know how else to put it. They are... A very strange team. Um, they did go out and make some decent moves. Uh, I forgot they also got Eric Fetty um, as well. Uh, we don't know who's going to be starting the third game uh, of the series against the Reds as well. Um, I guess I should say that. We do have Andrew Abbott, Hunter Green, and then Carson Spires going up against this Cardinals team. Um, I, I'm, I'm very confused by this team, Joe. Um, Alec Burleson's easily been their best hitter. Arnado has been coming on as uh, as of late, but he's not had the power numbers that we're used to. Brandon Donovan's been playing well, and Mason Wynn as well. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, where are you at with uh, with this Cardinals team this year that has been better in the last two months than they were really when they were struggling at the start of the season? Yeah, if it was vintage Paul Goldschmidt, Nolan Arenado, you might think this team's good. Like, they can make the playoffs. But they're just not the same anymore. Paul Goldschmidt, 232 average, still hitting for power with uh, 18 home runs. Nolan Arenado, better at 271, less home runs. Still provides some pretty good defense. But th- that's what's kind of missing is they have these guys that they were supposed to be stars. And as you mentioned, Alec Burleson's having a good year. Mason wins their best player. I, I think he's phenomenal. One of my favorite players to watch in the league, despite him being on uh, the evil empire of the Cardinals. Um they, ha- they just continue to find these guys and bring them up and have guys who can, can produce, so that's what we talked about earlier. Um, I I think they're they're probably where they should be in terms of record at 60 and 58. I, I, would, I don't want to predict the Cardinals to go under 500, but let like, just right under 500, compete for a playoff spot. I'm excited to uh, for this for this to see 
for this series, I want to see if we can kind of pitch around the power bats like Goldschmidt, who has 18 home runs, like Burleson, who has 20 home runs, like Nolan Gorman, who has 19 home runs. Um, that's that would be my my thing for the series, kind of the key. I do think like Mason Wynn's going to get on base. He's a superstar, uh, but I, you know, I, I don't think this is not pretty, that's not going to go well for us overall. I don't think just because of. Um, how many guys they have that stepped up that we just don't expect to step up this year? Yeah, it's been really weird. And, like, the other part that's weird is, like, their starting pitching has been awful. Uh, Miles Miklos is having a terrible year. Gibson's not been good. Sonny Gray's been their best, but he still has an ERA around Abbott's. Um, Lance Lynn's not been good. Andrew Palant- Palante has not been good. Uh, Matthew Libertor, they tried to fix it with. Steven Matz hasn't been good when he was healthy. And they traded for Eric Fetty, and he's not been good so far. Um, he's given up six runs and in ten innings pitched. Um, so not been bad, but not been great either. Uh, their bullpen is where they are pretty solid, though. Ryan Heasley or Helsley is having an outstanding season. Joe, he has thirty-seven saves uh, and forty opportunities. Um, again, Alexis Diaz has twenty-three. Um, this just shows you how many close games that they have been in as well. Um, and he has really locked it down for them. Uh, they have, I think, the most save opportunities in baseball. Um, they have a combined 51 save opportunities. So games within three runs, Joe. Um, actually, they have more than that. Sorry, I missed a couple down here. They have 54. They have 60 save opportunities this year, Joe, um, which just shows you how close their games have been. Um, luckily, you know, Ryan Helsley has, has been that guy for them, but uh, he has slowed it down a little bit. He's not been as great the last few weeks. I'm going to, Joe, I I think because Hunter Green is going, and I think Abbott's going to turn it around, even though I think their better hitters are lefty or are righties. I'm going to pick the Reds to go two and one in this series. I think they're at home. I don't think the Cardinals are as good, especially when it's not a close game. And I think the Reds are are due for, after a bad weekend, I think they're due for at least one big game uh, and then maybe a close game with Hunter Green. Um, but their starting pitching hasn't been very good either. I know they're getting, the Reds are getting two of their three best starters um, without a doubt, but I just, I feel like this Reds team has a little bit of fight left them and I think they're going to go two of three here. I'll go one and two. I've been picking that against most of the competitive teams in the National League for the Reds for the last couple little bit here. I think they have enough in the tank to get a win, but um, yeah, it does it does scare me. Like yeah, I mentioned avoiding home runs with some of these guys. Well, we have Abbott going, so that that's gonna be yeah. tough for him to avoid home runs against some of these power bats. But I think the tough part with this Cardinals lineup is if say you do pitch around Goldschmidt because he's hitting home runs. I mean, you still got Arenado, you got Mason Wynn, you got Burleson, you got Contreras, you got Gorman. It's a, it's a, there's no superstar. I mean, I did say Mason Wynn's a superstar. I do think he's a future superstar. There's no, like, guy that's, like, 300 with 40 home runs this year on this team. But they collectively are tough to deal with. Mm-hmm. I think that'll be our undoing. We've, we've talked about, uh, you know, if they're able to put up runs, we're probably not able to match them with our offense. Maybe one game we can, but that's kind of how I feel about it. We've, we've seemed to maybe have a new Reds killer in Mason Wynn, which is not fun after the last series we had against them. So, um, yeah, I'll go one and two. I, I, I think... This is a, a solid team uh, with guys who are stepping up in different ways that we just didn't expect, and, and that's something the Reds just did not have this year. I think it's either going to be 2-1 or 0-3. <laughs> that's where I'm at, uh, no. to be honest with you. I, I just – I just that's that's where my that's where my gut is telling me. Uh, it's been wrong a lot, so we'll have to see on that one. Uh, then we get the Royals. I'll be at the game on Friday. Joe, uh, I've been going to a lot more games this year than I have in the past. I'm kind of pumped about that. I got one more in September uh, for Bark in the Park. Uh, but the Reds are going to be playing the Royals. The Royals are a much better team than I think almost everybody expected uh, this year. They do have uh, one of the wild card spots. They are sixty five and fifty three. They have you talk about run differential. They have a plus ninety six, and they're not even leading their own division, Joe. Uh, but their lineup. Uh, give me one second. Sorry, I had this up and I accidentally clicked the wrong button. Where are you at, lineup? There we go. Okay, their lineup consists of some combination of players like uh, Michael Garcia, Michael Massey, Bobby Witt Jr., who's one of the best players in baseball right now, Vinny Pasquatino, uh, Salvador Perez, who continues to find a way to be awesome. Uh, They traded for Paul DeYoung. Hunter Renfro has been getting some time too. MJ Melendez, Freddie Furman, uh, Garrett Hampson, and Kyle Isbell. Uh, like I said, some combination of those guys. We don't know who's exactly going to be going for them pitching wise, uh, but their starters have been 
Uh, pretty solid to say the least. Seth Lugo is having an outstanding year. His easily his best year. Uh, Cole Reagans has been good. Brady Singer has found his way after a lot of P- Reds fans thought they might trade for him a couple of years ago. Uh, maybe they should have. He's been great. Michael Walk has been solid. Uh, Alec Marsh has been their only starter that has not been good. So they went out and they got Michael Lorenzen, uh, old friend, uh, who has been very solid as well. Uh, their bullpen has been good. James MacArthur is their closer, but he's not been great. Actually, the bullpen's been bad. Sorry, I was thinking of another team. Uh, their bullpen's not been very good this year. That's been what's causing them uh, a lot of problems. Hitting-wise, like we said, Bobby Witt is having an outstanding season. He's batting 374 this year, 22 home runs, Joe. Uh, Salvi Perez, is continu- he just ages like a fine wine. 280, 21 homers. Vinny Pasquitino, 17 home runs, 84 RBIs. Um, they've got their big three without a doubt. Everybody else around them's eh, I would say hitting wise, but these three, they are, uh, quite a problem to say the least, Joe. Uh, and we'll have to see who the Reds go up against pitching wise for them. Uh, cause their starting pitchers have been great as well. But, um, this series scares me. Uh, the Reds will have Nick Martinez, um, Nick Lodolo and Andrew Abbott going in this series. Um, I don't know what else to say. Uh, this is this is this is a potentially a very scary lineup. Uh, we're facing all of the Kansas City type teams, you know, the teams in that area. I forget what they call that corridor there, but um, it's scary, Joe. I'm afraid. Yeah, um, Bobby Wood Jr. is having one of the best seasons we can remember baseball. I know it's tough when we had Aaron Judge hit 62 home runs or whatever a couple mm-hmm. years ago. Um, but leading his team in every statistical offensive category, 347 batting average, 22 home runs, 87 RBI, 394 on base percentage, 164 hits, 604 slugging, and 998 on base plus slugging. Uh, there's He's the best player in baseball right now, like to this season, I think. Um, awesome superstar. I'm glad we get to watch this Ellie versus Bobby Wood Jr., mm-hmm. uh, this, this game. Uh, one set about Bobby Wood Jr. I just I love providing little color on some of the other teams we play because I love just watching some of these guys. Bobby Wood Jr. in July was the first player since Lou Gehrig in the 1930s to have a batting average over 400 for a month while having over <laughs> I think 40 or 45 hits was the number. It's so he dumb. is like breaking records. He's records like from the 19 third almost 100 year old record so he is awesome uh i will give kansas city a lot of credit i do think they're out kicking their coverage this year i don't think this yeah. roster is very talented top to bottom i think part of that is bobby witt jr 7.6 war you have a guy responsible for almost eight wins at this point of the season and guess what you're, you're they're like 10 games above 500 so i do think they're out kicking their coverage i don't, I don't think they're that t- now on paper i would say like hey this is a series that the Reds could win two to one if the Reds are playing up to their potential, but the Reds aren't playing up to their potential either. So I, I really do think uh, I'm excited to watch this series because Bobby Witt versus Ellie, but it probably will not go well for us. I'm going to say one and two for this series as well. Starting pitching good for them, as you mentioned, and then you could try to avoid Bobby Witt, but you're right. They do have some other good guys. I'm happy for Salvador Perez having another good season, 280 batting average. So I think one and two is fair for this series, which makes it not a great week, but uh, also just to you know that's we got a tougher schedule this week it's how it goes yeah and if you want to see how i think that ellie is going to progress uh in a similar way that bobby wood jr has joe um go go well i guess that's the point go and look at the batting averages and everything else that each player had had uh each year now i don't know if ellie's ever going to be a 350 hitter i don't know if he ever is going to hit 400 in a season or in a in a month i think he can i don't know if he ever will um but I will say you can see an interesting trend like batting average wise, strikeout wise, all of these things. Um, and I think that you can see why Bobby Wood Jr. and Ellie De La Cruz may end up being the best two players in their respective, uh, I guess, leagues um, in the future, uh, to be honest with you, Joe. Uh, and you got to remember as well that uh, Ellie's doing it at a younger age, too. So he still has another two years before. Uh, he would be the same age as Bobby Wood Jr. So by the time he's 24, we'll be able to look at back at Bobby Wood Jr. season and maybe think, wow, maybe Ellie is doing that for the Reds as well in the future, which would be uh, pretty outstanding because uh, Bobby Wood Jr. is unbelievable right now. I'm going to pick one and two uh, because I'm going to pray that they finally freaking win a game that I'm at on Friday. Um, I, I don't know if it's going to happen, but I'm going I'm to hope, uh, to be honest with you, Joe. Um, but I do like this Royals team. I think that that, core three is really interesting we'll have to see what they do once Perez 
um, retires here in the next however many years it's going to be for him because it feels like he's just – I thought he was going to retire like two years ago. Uh, he just continues to be awesome. So um, we'll have to see what happens there and, and if their starting pitching can really hold up in a ballpark like Cincinnati. But um, I'm also going to pick one and two. So that would be three and three on the week for me, two and four for you. I think that two and four would really, really, really hurt the Reds' chances. Uh, to be honest with you, Joe, I think pretty substantially. Uh, this season does not get much easier. September has gotten a lot harder. Teams like the Astros have kind of started to figure it out. Um, you still got to face the Brewers one more time, the, the Cardinals, the Cubs. So, um, you know, the Reds are just going to have to play well. They, they have to find wins where they can uh, if they really want to make a run. Otherwise, I think they're just going to kind of stall out uh, right around that two or three games under, Joe. Uh, I could really, really see this team end up, you know, uh, being... What would that be? I think a similar record as last year. I'd be like 79 and 82 or something like that. Um, or 83. Yeah, 79, 83. Something like that. I, I would not be surprised to see the Reds do that again. Uh, but any final words, last words, wise words, all those things as we sign off here? Yeah, just a couple small thoughts here. Um, for anyone who's a baseball fan as well, and even not, just check it out. The Yankees and Tigers are playing in the Little League Classic mm-hmm. on Sunday night. This is played at, like, location where the Little League World Series is, I wish they would play at a Little League field where the fences were like 200 feet away because that would just be a lot of fun. But it is a very really cool event where MLB is trying to do different events in different cities. And that brings me to my next point uh, that they're playing in an NASCAR track next yes. year. We're playing in Bristol, Tennessee. We're playing the Braves August 2nd. I'm going to try to go 100,000 fans. Don't know how much the tickets are going to cost. Uh, but it is always fun. Like, I wanted to go to the Field of Dreams game. That was impossible to get tickets. So, you know, you couldn't really do that. I will probably find my way there at some point. But uh, it's going to probably set the baseball all-time attendance record, so I'm kind of excited for it. I'm kind of sad it's only one game instead of a series. It's kind of a weird time. I think it's a mm-hmm. Sunday, August 2nd. Um, so it's kind of a weird thing, but I'll be trying to go. It seems pretty cool. Um, like to play the Braves, and you also got two teams who are meeting in the middle. Like, the Reds country has kind of gone down through Kentucky. The Braves goes up to Tennessee. Braves were the team of the South for the 90s and, you know, everything else. So that it's going to be fun atmosphere, I think, with the with kind of two teams that have a lot of good young players. And uh, I'm excited for that. Yeah, I am too, Joe. I think it's going to be really fun. I've actually been to Bristol once as a kid to watch a NASCAR race. Uh, when my dad was really into NASCAR, we went to a bunch of different places uh, in the area. So I don't remember it very well. I think it was like 12 uh, so, uh, my old man self, it's been about 20 years. Uh, that's sad to say, but, uh, yeah, I was there many years ago to watch a race. Um, I would love to go, uh, as well. I'm, I'm considering strongly considering going, maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll both go down caravan down and see a fun game. Uh, I think that would be a really fun game to watch too. Cause I think the Reds will be a better team by that point. And I think the Braves will definitely be uh, a better team because uh, I was just looking at this real quick, looking at last year's stats. Um, Joe, the Braves are two games away right now, two losses away from tying their loss record for last year. So uh, just to give you uh, how far they are following right now, um, it is it is wild to see. But um, yeah, I think that's going to wrap it up for us, Joe. Uh, we thank all of you who do listen and watch. Thank, thank you to all of you who uh, like and subscribe as well. And uh, with that, guys, we'll catch you on the next one.